Thank you for listening to the history of the papacy. I am your host, Steve. I would highly encourage you to take a listen and subscribe to my re-released Beyond the Big Screen, which you can find on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. If you like what you hear, I would definitely appreciate you leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts for both the history of the papacy and Beyond the Big Screen. I should quickly mention we are back on Patreon uh, at patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. Of course, there's four tiers, Antioch, Alexandria, and Constantinople. And the biggest thing with these is you will be included on the history of the papacy diptychs. But you'll also get bonus audio and video content, Pope coin coming soon, monthly book drawings, early content, and free content. For as little as 10 cents US a day, you can join this list. And if you want to be on the list, you got to join early so you're on the tops of the lists. If you want to be at the very top of the list, it's less than 50 cents a day. People buy coffees that are 8, 9, 10 times that price. 50 cents a day, not too bad. This time around, we have two new patrons to add to the history of the papacy diptychs. I am very happy to welcome... Alex at the Antioch level and Sarah at the Alexandria level. Thank you, Alex and Sarah, for your support and for joining up and getting your names on the history of the papacy diptychs. I very much appreciate it. Now, let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the history of the papacy diptychs. We have Roberto, Joran, William, Brian, Jeffrey, Christina, John, and Sarah at the Alexandria level. We have Dapo, Paul, Justin, and Lana, all of whom are magnificent at Constantinople and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome. We have Peter the Great. Today we're continuing our Summer of Scholars series, or Winter of Wisdom, for those of us on the Southern Hemisphere. I don't know why I said those of us, including myself. I'm not in the Southern Hemisphere, but you get my drift. I'm very happy today to be joined by Professor James Papandrea. Dr. Papandrea is one of my favorite modern-day church historians. I mean, come on, who doesn't have their favorite church historians? If they had baseball cards of them, I'd have a collection of all of them. But anyway, we have a wide-ranging conversation with Professor Papa Andrea about the early church and all different aspects of the early church. Now, this is part one of a two-part conversation with Professor Papa Andrea, so look forward to part two soon, and I'll talk to you next time. Well, we are joined today by Professor James Papa Andrea, and this is actually take two. We had a little bit of a uh, technological problem the last time, which uh, spoiled the recording. But I think today's going to be even better because we have I've thought through and the some of the questions and the things that we discussed in the what we are calling the rehearsal interview brought up a lot of things for me to think about. So I think we're, this is going to be an even better conversation than the one you missed. But before we get started too far, Professor Papa Andrea is a professor of church history and historical theology at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary at Northwestern University. I, uh, I always like to ask the question, how did you get interested in the early church? Well, I was always drawn to um, to the faith, to the scriptures, and um, I ended up going to seminary. And uh, this was back when I was a Protestant, so I went to a Protestant seminary, which which was a very good seminary. But um, one of the things that I didn't get at seminary was a, a good grounding in the church fathers and in the early church. And so I kind of uh, realized that there was a gap in my education. On top of that, my experience at seminary was characterized by a lot of arguing between the students. And I, I happened to be at a seminary that was heavily Calvinist. 
I was never a Calvinist, even as a Protestant. So I was sort of this, you know, like lone Wesleyan, Arminian, quasi Thomist guy swimming upstream in a Calvinist river. And uh, it occurred to me that if there can be that much disagreement among Protestants over the meaning of scriptures, and we would argue about Romans 8 for hours, um, I needed to know what the original Christians thought these things meant and how, and what they believed. And because I really felt like since they're closer in time to Jesus and the apostles, they should have a better handle on, uh, you know, how to interpret the new Testament and, you know, the, the core beliefs of Christianity. And so, you know, eventually when I went to do my PhD, I was determined to study the early church and the church fathers and really see what that was all about. Now, you're doing a video series on the early church, and it's always a question of what is the early church and what kind of time frame do you put on the early church? Yeah, that's that is the million dollar question. And, um, you know, I my, my video series is called The Original Church. Right. And so um, I am defining the original church as the church before any permanent schisms or splits of the church. And you probably know this, that the first permanent split of Christianity happened in uh, in the aftermath of the Council of Chalcedon, which it was in 451. So primarily we're looking at the time in the church before the middle of the fifth century there, about 451. Um, but then also within that, I'm focusing even more on the time period in the early church before Christianity was legalized by the Emperor Constantine, and that took place in the year 311. So um, before the uh, the church sort of becomes legal and then eventually converts the empire, um, but that comes with baggage as well. And so, um, so we're looking at a time when the church was still one and when the church was still very, very countercultural. I think a lot of my questions when I when I watch videos or your videos or I do a lot of reading is really basic questions of organization. And I guess, I mean, even the first question I would come up with is what did the earliest church look like? You know, your average person going to a Christian church ceremony, like even as simple as what did the building look like? Like, where did they actually physically go? Right. Well, you know, uh, for the first, um, you know, 300 years of the church's existence, you could not walk down the street and see a church. Uh, a church was not a, a building or a place at all. Um, the church was the group of people meeting in somebody's home around the table of the Eucharist. And so the church really was defined as the body of Christ and the table of Christ. And so that was the church, and they were meeting in people's homes. Um, at the very beginning, uh, they may very well have been meeting more in the evenings than in the mornings, but eventually the Eucharistic uh, liturgy becomes a morning uh, celebration on Sunday mornings. And, um, and so, you know, in the very early days, Christian worship was in the context of a meal, like a potluck dinner. Um, and, uh, and so they were really sort of trying to continue what Jesus himself started at the last supper. Um, but you know, you can already read in first Corinthians 11, how there are problems with the idea of having the Eucharist as a part of a meal. And some of the Corinthians were treating that meal like it was, you know, an old Roman banquet and they were getting drunk and they were getting rowdy. And so eventually I think for that reason and for other reasons too, the, um, the the Eucharist itself gets pulled out of the meal and placed in the morning on a Sunday morning, especially. And um, but again, still meeting in people's homes. Talking about the the agape and the the meal portion and the Roman the Greco Roman banquet, I've interviewed scholars and read some papers that say that the earliest Christian liturgy kind of worked around. A in, in the framework, I guess you might say, of a Greco-Roman banquet. But then, like you said, it's split out into these different portions. And I guess, um, what's your feeling on that? Did the original Christians use that framework of the Greco-Roman banquet? Or was there something else going on? 
Yeah, I don't think they did. Um, I, I think for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, wealthy people went to Roman banquets. And in the earliest decades and even centuries of the church, the wealthy were in the minority among Christians. Most of the Christians were going to be poorer people who would not think to organize their worship around a Roman banquet. No, the worship of the early Christian church was a spinoff, if that's the right term, of Jewish worship. So in other words, um, the, the Sabbath table rituals and the Passover rituals, those would be the background for uh, early Christian liturgy and especially the Eucharist. And, um, and I think that uh, Scott Hahn and some of the other Steubenville folks have done some good work on connecting the Eucharist to, let's say, the, the cup rituals of, of the Jewish meal. Um, but, uh, but I would say that it was much more based on, on Jewish rituals than on pagan banquets. We hear that I've heard we hear that word the agape, and that's the love feast. Was that the direct connection to the Eucharist, or were they two separate things? Like the love feast was kind of the potluck component, and then the Eucharist was the more sacramental part of it, and they were two separates, or did they kind of were they together and then evolved separately into their own components? Yeah. Well, a kind of a little of both. I mean, um. They, I, I think they, they did start out together and then evolved separately. Um, and again, I think that because the Last Supper, in the Last Supper, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, the, the Holy Communion, the Eucharist, as a part of that meal. And again, coming out of the Jewish tradition, I think that uh, the early Christians probably tried to keep that vibe going where the Eucharist was part of the meal. But um, eventually, it, it wasn't sustainable, and they they separated out. Conceptually, though, I think they were always two different things. It's interesting because the word agape, as you said, is one of about four or five different Greek words for love, and we translate it as the love feast. But the word feast is not in there. It really is just the love. And so they thought of this potluck meal as the love. Well, the what we call the mass, um, that ritual that surrounded Holy Communion, they simply called that the Thanksgiving. And so, of course, the Greek word for Thanksgiving is the, is, uh, the word that we say as Eucharist. That is, that's, that is the, the word for Thanksgiving. So, so they had these two things, the love and the Thanksgiving. The love was the meal and the sharing of the, of the meal and the, the sharing of resources so that those who had more brought more and those who had less got to eat. Um, and the Thanksgiving then was the, the, uh, the liturgy with the Eucharistic prayers and, and, and the sharing of Holy Communion. Now, I have a question, and it's kind of two questions in one, but I think you get the idea, like the maybe the broad idea and the general uh, conception is that th these house churches, and we hear so much about house churches, and then you, I think, and then you have this idea of a shared meal. And I'm thinking a lot of people think like, oh, you know, let's go to Jim's house this Friday and we'll have a little bit of a meal and maybe we'll read a little Bible and, you know, have kind of a rap session. Is that what was happening in the earliest Christianity or were they even at the earliest times? Was there a formalized script, so to speak? Yeah, well, it's a great question because when you talk about, the, say, the first century, you know, we have snippets. We have snippets in Paul of, you know, of some things that are going on. And, and, and sometimes the snippets we get from Paul are, are based on problems like, you know, people getting drunk at the, at the love before the Eucharist or too many people speaking in tongues and it's getting chaotic and nobody knows what anybody's saying. So you get these snippets and then even all the way up to the book of Revelation where you have, you know, like the holy, 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 and you have these things that, you know, are clearly related. I mean, John describes this as what's going on in heaven, but it's clearly related to what's going on in worship as well. Um, now, by the time we get to the year about 150, then we have a document by Justin Martyr, his first apology, and he, he basically says, here's what we do in worship. Now, he's writing for pagans. He's writing this for non-Christians. So it's not, you know, it's not an order of worship that other Christians would use to follow. 
But he, if you read it, it sounds very much like uh, liturgy today. Um, it, it, is, it is kind of a formal order of worship. Um, there's some room for improvisation, but it's pretty, um, you know, it's like you'd recognize it. If you read it, you would recognize it as uh, it seems like, wow, in the year 150, they were doing what we still do now. And so clearly that didn't come out of nowhere. It wasn't at one point they're just hanging out. And then a hundred years later, it's a strict formalized event. That's right. And you have to assume that if Justin Martyr is going to write this letter to the emperor and say, this is what Christians do, he had to be pretty confident that that's what Christians were doing kind of across the board. I mean, there was some room for diversity of practice within liturgy, but for the most part, he had to be able to feel confident that he was speaking for not just his house church, but Christians in general. And um, and so, yeah, these things don't pop up out of the blue. You have to assume that, you know, the first time you see something in a document, if it was new, then you would also have other documents objecting to it. Right. But the fact that nobody's objecting to it means it's not new. It's accepted. Then we talk about the house church and the physical building. The earliest house churches, I assume, were people's homes. But that's a kind of a wide uh, spectrum of living arrangements. Some people live in big houses. Some people lived in apartments. What do we know about what those earliest places, how did they arrange their space? Well, we don't know too much about that. Um, it, it must have been all across the board. I don't get the sense that they bounced around, though. I don't get the sense that, like, well, you know, church is at my house this week, but it'll be at your house next week. I get the sense that each each congregation, as it were, would have a patron who was the host of the house church. If you had wealthy people in your congregation, then those people would offer up you know, space in their homes um, but if not, you know, there were, they had apartment buildings, they had tenement buildings. Um, sometimes they would all cram into a small apartment building, depending on what was available to them. Over time, and I mean, over, you know, the first couple of hundred years, eventually you do start to get uh, archaeological evidence of people modifying or remodeling homes to make it, uh, you know, to facilitate Christian worship. So um, maybe, Maybe there were two apartment buildings and they took out the wall between them, uh, which is not always safe, but, but some people did it. Um, maybe they added a baptistry to a house or maybe a house that was a, that was a Jewish house that had a Jewish mikvah bath. Maybe that was converted into a Christian baptistry. And, you know, the way you'd know that is because it was turned into a shape of a cross or there are mosaics of, with Christian symbols or whatever. Um, so we do start to see then in the third century, um, these modifications of homes, um, and then eventually homes or buildings sort of set aside where no one lives there, but that's the worship space. But it's not until the fourth century, the 300s, that, um, that any, in, any buildings were built specifically to be churches. So in the first couple hundred years, it's, uh, you know, we're not really sure. We just know that they were meeting in people's homes. And now a word from our sponsors. I wonder, is the, was the, the model, was there a model available, like say amongst second temple Jews, they, did they have standalone religious structures or were they kind of in the same boat that if it was, if you weren't in the actual Jerusalem temple, you may do with what you could, what you had in town? Well, they did have synagogues. And so, um, you know, if, if the Christians would have built church buildings in the first, second, or even third century, they may very well have been tempted to model them after Jewish synagogues, but they didn't. And when they did build their first church buildings that were built specifically to be churches, those were paid for by the Emperor Constantine. So they weren't built on the model of the Jewish synagogue. They were built on the model of the Roman meeting house, which is the word basilica. We think the word basilica means a church, but actually basilica just means a big rectangular building 
with a focal point at one end for a lot of people to meet in. And so, you know, if you look at some of the uh, ancient churches in Rome, um, like, for example, uh, you know, the, the Cathedral of Rome, which is St. John Lateran, or um, the uh, St. Saint Paul outside the walls, which burned down and re was rebuilt, but on the same floor plan, uh, you get the sense of these, these huge structures that could hold thousands of people. Um, those are, that's the kind of building that was built uh, for the first actual church buildings. Then that uh, the the talk all like I think all of these things lead up to the the mass and the physical space and the congregation. To what were they reading? I mean, like you know, a, a liturgy or a mass to this day, the text is such a key component of it. What were these earliest Christians using as their sacred text? Yeah, well, the you know the earliest Christians, the the Bible of you know the apostles and the earliest Christians would have been the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament in Greek. Um, it would include you know those deuterocanonical books like Wisdom and Tobit and Maccabees. Some people um, would would call that the Catholic Old Testament or whatever, but um, but it would it would be that. Um, now, obviously. With during the ministry of Jesus, you know, I think when you read about oh Jesus and the disciples, they go into a synagogue and someone reads the Torah. There, they're probably reading in Hebrew. Um, but for the most part, the Bible of the early earliest Christians was in Greek. The New Testament, you know, we don't start getting New Testament documents until you know maybe the late 40s, but probably the 50s of the first century, and even then. It would be more like, okay, now that we're done reading the scriptures, let's read this letter we got from Paul, right? And so it takes time for um, for the the idea of a New Testament to take hold, where someone can say, oh, the writings of Paul are on the same level of of, of inspiration as the old, uh, you know, the 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 Old Testament. Um, and uh, so that takes a little while. So, but but certainly by the end of the first century the uh, the church has documents that they are starting to put up next to what we call the Old Testament as the you know the New Testament and um, and it takes a while for the, for the the canon of or the, the 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 collection of documents that we call the New Testament to become formalized but um, but in the second century we know that you know different documents were circulating as collections so if you had the money you could buy a collection of Paul's letters you could buy the four gospels in a collection and, you know, it just kind of snowballs from there. It's probably tough to say because there's um, not, I'm sure there's not a lot of evidence of it, but I'm assuming that a poorer congregation, they might not have anything, any written material. That's uh, that, that may be true. And um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the Hebrew scriptures or the Septuagint, um, they would probably be at least one copy of this, I think, you know, in a congregation, but you make a good point. I mean, it may be the case that there were house churches that simply didn't have the documents. And, um, and so they were just operating entirely on what they were taught by word of mouth by the apostles and, and their disciples. And then, you know, as soon as they could get copies of the letters of Paul, they, they were reading those and, and it went from there. Yeah, it almost seems like a something like a letter from Paul could take on a sacred value quickly if that's the only thing you actually have. And they're not that long. They're not a huge scroll or a codex that's expensive and long and has yeah. tons of parchment. So you get a couple of sheets of paper from Paul or um, James or something, and that could take on a sacred value really quickly. Well, that's true. And, and I, you know, I, I imagine that if you, let's say, you know, you're in a house church in some small town and you hear that the house church in the next town over is, you know, Thessalonica, they got a letter from Paul. First thing you're going to do is send a scribe over there to copy it and bring back a copy. Um, and on top of that, let's say, you know, that Paul's writing his letters mostly in the fifties. Well, 15, 16 years later, He's been martyred. 
So within that short amount of time, now his letters are going to take on uh, even more of a sort of, uh, you know, inspired quality once he's been martyred. Um, and so uh, that kind of builds builds that as well. Is there any writing, sort of meta writing of, because a lot of the things that Paul wrote were really specific, like he's correcting something in Corinth, or he's discussing a particular thing that's going on in Rome. When did people start to try and extrapolate bigger messages out of these letters than just the local issue that Paul was addressing? Well, that's a great question because, you know, I, I, I still think that, you know, when Paul's writing his letters and certainly when, when some of the, you know, gospels were being written, there's still this sense that, well, you know, Jesus is probably coming back in our lifetime. So who needs a systematic theology because there aren't going to be third generation Christians or whatever like that. So, so there wasn't that sense of urgency. And, um, I think even the church fathers after the, the time of the New Testament are still writing uh, very much for specific situations. So Clement of Rome is right, writes his letter um, to the Corinthians, we call it First Clement, because there's a problem in Corinth. Um, Ignatius of Antioch writes his letters um, in part because he sees issues that he wants to address. And so it, it really isn't until I mean, I want to say, you know, Irenaeus uh, in, in the late second century, where you start to get these comprehensive documents that try to like lay out theology. But even, even when he does it, he's doing it to oppose Gnosticism, to oppose some heresy. Um, but the great theologians, uh, Irenaeus of Lyon, and then I would say Tertullian, the um, and Tertullian is writing to oppose, you know, what he sees as heresy as well. But in doing that, they're now beginning to write more fleshed out theology. And, uh, and it happens, it happens little by little. And now a word from our sponsors. Maybe let's go back and talk a little bit about the the sacrament. So we have the Eucharist and, and that one came up really early, but maybe we can talk a little bit about the initiation rites because in the first generations, it's mostly adults becoming Christian. And so what some of them were Jews and had familiarity with what this was going on. But then you have a lot of people who are coming in, they're Greeks, they're Romans, Syriacs, who don't have a lot of exposure to this Jewish, Second Temple Jewish background of Christianity. What kind of uh, study would a Christian have had to have done in that very earliest time to open the door to get in? Yeah, so we do have evidence of catechesis that goes on to prepare people for baptism. And as you pointed out, um, in the early decades, uh, we don't get a lot of second generation Christians. So you don't get a lot of children and infants being baptized. It, it was happening, of course, but most of the people converting into the church are adults. And especially for the ones who are coming in from Greco-Roman backgrounds, uh, where they, they come from a religion. Religion in the Greco-Roman world is not about morality, right? I mean, uh, the, the Greco-Roman gods don't care what you do behind closed doors, and they don't care how you treat your fellow human being. And so for a lot of these reasons, the, the biggest issue for someone who wants to be baptized into the church is that they're going to have to completely change their lifestyle. Again, especially if they're not coming from Judaism. And so catechesis in the early church is much more about how to behave as a Christian than what to believe. Now, don't get me wrong. They, you know, they probably learned some form of a creed. They would have learned the Our Father. So there would be some teaching there in terms of what to believe, and they would certainly have to sort of be on board with the Trinity as, as, as much as they could be. But beyond that, the, the church kind of assumed that, well, they'll get their theology after their baptism. And what's really most important to prepare for baptism is to be ready for the very 
serious commitment baptism is in terms of like promising to live a Christian lifestyle and not be engaged in a lot of the sins that were perfectly acceptable in Roman culture. Uh, so, so for a Roman man who, you know, was used to Roman society to come into the church, what, you mean I only get to have my wife and no other women, you know, what, you know, that's, that's a new thing. And so you have to make sure that th this person is ready for that commitment. Otherwise it'll be too easy for him to slip up, fall back into old ways and, you know, put his salvation in jeopardy, but also embarrass the church. So, so, um, so yeah, it, Catechesis was much more, much more about morality than about theology. When people knew people who are interested in Christ or were interested in Christianity, and they're showing up at the door at one of these early clubs, you know, people had, hanging out at a house church, how much would they, or at least what do we know of what they would have been allowed to see? Would have somebody who's coming to just check things out, would they have been able to see the whole shebang or were they gonna okay you can stay for the meal portion but when we get down to business that that's when you have to go like what kind of developed later on yeah well you know i think the truth is is that the early church is not a seeker sensitive church in any way so no one would really just sort of show up like it's it's not like anyone in the roman culture would say you know i've heard about this christianity thing i think i'm gonna go check it out I don't think that happens. What what happens is you know someone who's a Christian, you talk to them about it and they bring you, right? So if you if you show up at church, you're coming with someone who can vouch for you. And um and then as far as like what they would be allowed to see or participate in, I think in the early decades of the church that 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 may have been all over the map. Um not that they would have been offered the Eucharist itself without getting baptized. But beyond that, they may have been able, some in some places may have been able to watch the, you know, the initiated receive the Eucharist, hear all the Eucharistic prayers. I think it's later when space allows for it that we have, you know, uh, you know kind of situations that, that you might be familiar with where um, the catechumens are asked to, to leave or, or, you know, in, in some places, um, there's evidence that a lot of curtains were used. And so the catechumens might be behind a curtain where they can hear what's going on, but not actually see the real presence of Jesus in the, in the sacrament, you know, th these kinds of things. But, you know, it's at the very beginning, it's probably all over the map. Oh, so when you hear the term hearer, they were literally just hearing what was going on. Well, that's true. And also, if uh, someone was under penance, so let's say, um, you know, someone had committed a grave sin and they confessed it, um, part of their penance might be, yeah, you're going to have to stand behind that curtain for a while. And, you know, um, and they would be hearers um, until, until their time of reconciliation. You know, it's not like now, if you go to confession now, you sort of expect that by the time you come out, you're, you're reconciled. Right. But but in the early church, not necessarily. It might be, OK, well, you know, you're going to do this penance for seven weeks or three years or whatever it is. And at the end of that time period, then you will be reconciled to the church and then you'll be able to come out from behind that curtain. So um, it just depends. I read some books about the um, what they know a little bit about the early Dura Europa's church. And um, I can the author um, of the book escapes me right now, but he was kind of saying that in the initiation process, at least that they think at, at Dura Europas, there was baptism because they had a baptistry there. But then their thinking is that the second phase of the anointing with oil, the chrismation period was almost as important as that baptism part and that they were done at the same time. Was baptism and chrismation or sealing with oil anointing with oil was that kind of a universal practice in the early church of getting like kind of those um baptism chrismation and then getting the eucharist all in one shot at your initiation right for lack of a better word was that a more was that common or was there a lot of regional variation in that well i think it i think it was common but there was also regional variation uh, you mentioned the dura europas church and i think um now, I'm not an archaeologist specifically, but I think that's a good example of a 
of a house that's converted into a church, right? And uh, so there are some, some, there's some good art there, Christ, early Christian art. Um, but to answer your question, I mean, uh, I, you know, I always tell my students that, especially if you grow up in the Protestant world, they tell you that the early Christians had only two sacraments, baptism and, uh, and Holy Communion or Eucharist. And I say, well, A, that's not true. And B, even, even so, each of those two sacraments was two in one. So with the Eucharist was confession. You would never go to receive the Eucharist without first confessing your sins. And that could happen in different ways, but Eucharist and confession were kind of like one thing. In the same way, baptism and you know, what you're calling chrismation or confirmation were one thing. Now, in the early church, when you do the anointing with oil is kind of all over the map. So some people are doing an anointing with oil before the, the water baptism. Some people are doing the anointing with oil after the water baptism. Others are doing an anointing before and an anointing after. And I think what uh, sort of evolves out of this is that there is an anointing that is associated with the, with the water baptism, and then there is an anointing that is associated with the confirmation. This, of course, is when the baptism is confirmed and the Holy Spirit is received. Um, and these are two sacraments now, but they were one back then. And I'm sure that many people back then also did what we would call First Communion right then as well, especially for adults. Baptism, confirmation, first Eucharist. And to this day, our Eastern brothers and sisters still do this, still do it that way. All three of those sacraments of initiation are done together. But, um, but over time in the Western church, baptism and confirmation become separated out into two distinct rites, partly because there were so many people getting baptized, especially after Christianity is legalized, that one bishop in a city could no longer do all the baptisms. But the one bishop in the city still wanted to be able to do all the confirmations, right? So, so that's one reason why those things got separated. Um, so it's probably in about the third century that those become two distinct rites in the Western church. 